Good afternoon. We start our afternoon section uh, about chairs, sites, and costumes. And I would like to introduce our first speaker who is joining us, hopefully, online. Oven Laub, he's an art historian and curator. He has been a frequent collaborator with Robert Wilson since 2013 and has produced numerous gallery and museum exhibitions of Wilson's work. In 2022, he organized the exhibition Robert Wilson Chairs uh, in New York. He is currently editing a publication on Wilson's use of chairs forthcoming later this year. He has served on the board of the Robert Wilson Arts Foundation since its establishment in 2016. Please join me in welcoming Oven Lab. Um, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Owen Laub. I um, was Robert Wilson's, I worked with Bob as a head of studio from 2019 to 2021. Um, I was his personal assistant from 2015 to 2017. Um, and I was a participant in the summer program at the Watermill Center in 2013. Um, and I just first want to say thank you to Frank and Marcus and Viola for organizing this conference. Um, it's just so exciting to hear about all of the work that's being done far and wide on Bob's work and have this forum to connect and learn about what everyone is doing. Um, so my, I'll be reading a paper that I'm preparing for a version of this paper will be published in a book that's forthcoming um, later this year. Uh, and the subject of the book is Robert Wilson's chairs, chairs he's designed for the theater um, from the beginning of his career through the present. Um, the title of the paper, paper I'll be reading today is Site, Space, Form, Robert Wilson's Chairs on Stage. Um, but I've been thinking about retitling the, the work for publication, um, drawing the stage around the site and that is an allusion to um, the subject of the, of the paper. Um, the book is for a general audience, so there are some, um, there's some history which may be a recap or an overview, um, but in the context of the chairs, I thought it was important to include. Um, and basically, this essay is an attempt to respond to the question of seeing Robert Wilson's chairs as sculpture. Um, so I will begin. I just wanted just to confirm that the connection is working and people can hear me before I start reading. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Robert Wilson is looking at two chairs placed in the center of a room. They are nearly identical, side by side, facing us. The warm tones of their materials, wood and cane, present a satisfying contrast to the gray archival boxes organized within a system of white shelves behind them. Situated between two sources of light, the chairs are shadowless and appear to float above the gray carpet on which they stand. The eye oscillates as it perceives two identical forms, and through these saccades, a sense of visual tension rises. The optical vibration achieves a tacit and consistent frequency. We look at the chairs. Bob approaches, turns one chair at an angle toward the other, and returns. Through the newly apparent negative space between the back and seat of the turned chair, a diagonal is drawn where a parallel had been. The disposition of the two chairs changes, a visual analogy, analogy for a musical composition changing from the serial repetition of two notes to three. We look. We move the chairs. Empty light and space refill the void where each had been. The east side of the room is a glass curtain wall. The evening sky is a deep darkening blue. There, by the window, one chair is placed directly beneath an overhead light, 
the other is laid on its side as if fallen. Shadows now duplicate their forms. The fallen chair has lost the property of function, has become the trace of a possible action, has become a kind of vestigial appendage to the standing one. This is how I see them, Bob says. We are at the Watermill Center, Wilson's 10-acre laboratory for performance on the east end of Long Island, in a recently renovated site for archival research that had previously been a near monastic dormitory for artists in residence. The room, with windows punctuating all four walls, recalls the non-architecture of a studio loft in Lower Manhattan, like the one in which Wilson worked with a small community of artists, the Bird Hoffman School of Birds, to develop a distinctive approach to theater a half century ago. Bird Hoffman, the collective's namesake, had been a teacher who Wilson credits with helping him to overcome a stutter by slowing his movements as a child in Waco, Texas. Wilson's first theatrical works were largely silent, their dramatic tension driven by light, movement, and sonography. In these productions, he began to situate chairs as architectural elements within precise and changing total environments. In The King of Spain and The Life and Times of Sigmund Freud, both first performed in 1969, a suspended chair was lowered from the proscenium slowly throughout the piece, coming to rest on the stage floor in the final act. The hanging chair was, quote, a kind of timepiece to measure the length of the play. Other such timepieces in The Life and Times of Sigmund Freud included a jogger who ran across the stage continuously throughout the performance, a performer in a tortoise costume who crept from one end of the stage to the other for 37 minutes, and Cheryl Sutton, who sat virtually motionless in a floor-length black gown with a prop raven at her left hand. In 1970, Wilson made an historic debut, Deaf Man Glance, a three-hour-long silent opera with premieres in New York at the Brooklyn Academy of Music and in France at the Nancy Festival and the Théâtre de la Musique in Paris. The triumphant reception of Deaf Man Glance in Paris in Paris, anticipated a series of subsequent works for the stage. The 24-hour Overture in 1972, Ka Mountain and Gardenia Terrace, a seven-day spectacle on a succession of hilltops during the Shiraz Persepolis Festival of the Arts in 1972, the 12-hour performance The Life and Times of Joseph Stalin, 1973, A Letter for Queen Victoria, 1974, Einstein on the Beach, the seminal opera with Philip Glass, 1976, and I was sitting on my patio, the sky appeared, I thought I was hallucinating, 1977, a repeated monologue performed by Wilson and Lucinda Childs. In these performances, Wilson continued to work with a collective of both trained and untrained performers, artists, and those met through chance encounters. Paul Tech had a role in Deaf Man Glance and contributed sonography to Overture. Gordon Mata Clark made set elements for The Life and Times of Sigmund Freud and performed alongside Jack Smith. Sigmund Freud himself was played by a man Wilson had noticed in Grand Central Terminal, who bore a resemblance to the father of psychoanalysis. A letter for Queen Victoria was developed with then 14-year-old Christopher Knowles now a recognized poet and artist who Wilson encountered after being sent an audio tape of Knowles reading his poetry. When A Letter for Queen Victoria had its debut in Paris, Wilson's grandmother from Texas performed the title role. Many of the chairs in these early productions were found objects selected for their ready-made forms, evoking the austerity of a rural American home the intrigue of a Victorian drawing room, or the banality of the present day. Their poetic function emerged through instances of unexpected visual counterpoint, a technique resonant throughout the work of the pre-war surrealists. One of surrealism's progenitors, Louis Aragon, attended the Paris premiere of Deaf Man Glance and subsequently published an open letter addressed to the late André Breton, in which he writes, quote, Bob Wilson's piece is what we others who fathered surrealism 
dreamed it might become after us, beyond us. In time, Wilson began to design each chair specifically for the stage. For a letter for Queen Victoria, he fabricated a table, a cafe table and chair from the components of an industrial metal shelving system and a pair of thrones surfaced in lead and embedded with functioning car headlights. For Einstein on the beach, a series of chairs was constructed from plumbing pipe, a nod to Albert Einstein's suggestion that he might choose to relive his life as a plumber. For death, destruction, and Detroit, a pair of rooftop sunbathers lounged in nickel-plated beach chairs while a city burned below. In 1977, Wilson revisited the hanging chair from the life and times of Sigmund Freud, reconceiving it in wire mesh grid as a sculptural form to be suspended midair. When lit from a single source, the Freud hanging chair projects its articulated shadow onto a nearby wall. Light and matter become a single optical composition, and from no perspective can either form be seen without the other. Perceiving the hanging chair as a duality, each image is transformed by the other's dimensionality or depthlessness. Quote, objects are the children of their own shadows, writes the late poet Etel Adnan. As sculpture, the hanging chair becomes a metonym for Wilson's emergent dramaturgy, a theater that exists on the pictorial plane, a proposition of illusion as emancipatory and naturalism as a false idea, a false ideal. For some of Wilson's contemporaries, the relation between a work and its site became a central concern. In 1966, Robert Morris wrote, quote, one apprehends the object from various positions and under varying conditions of light and spatial context. Ideally, it is a space without architecture as background and reference that would give different terms to work with, end quote. In 1987, describing the mission of his nascent Chinati Foundation in Marfa, Texas, Donald Judd would write, quote, somewhere a portion of contemporary art has to exist as an example of what the art and ex its context were meant to be. Somewhere a strict measure must exist for the art of this time and place. On stage, as sculpture performing the function of furniture, Wilson's chairs complicate the relation between work and sight. For Wilson, the form of a chair considers its position within the composition of a scene. In turn, the scene is composed to afford the chair a site, a site that, returning to Morris, is, quote, a space without architecture as background and reference. Quote, the space of art was no longer perceived as a blank slate, a tabula rasa, but a real place, end quote, writes art historian Miwan Kwan. Quote, if minimalism returned the viewing subject to a physical corporeal body, institutional critique insisted on the social matrix of class, race, gender, and sexuality of the viewing subject, end quote. The artist's Kwan references anticipated the ways in which the real, physical, and social space of the museum, commons, or landscape affects a tacit reflex in the viewing subject. For these artists, a work has the ability to make conscious this historically unconscious reflex. For Wilson, the stage is a space in which the possibility for real encounter with a work is suspended, yielding to the potential to choreograph physical presence through performance. Wilson quotes Andy Warhol, I want to be a machine. His actors transcend the affectations of naturalism. They portray encounters in which subjects, objects, and sites anticipate one another. On stage, Wilson seeks to, seeks to recuperate the innocence of space through the ephemerality of performance. For some of Wilson's contemporaries, like Judd, the physical relation between work and site was critical. In the words of Richard Serra, 
to remove the work is to destroy the work. Though designed for the stage, Wilson's chairs anticipate removal, redeeming this inevitability as something generative, even playful. Their site is always already understood to have been elsewhere. As we look at the chairs, Bob tells a story. In 1979, the Dalai Lama was visiting Houston, Texas to see Dominique de Menil, the arts patron and humanitarian. They would participate in a public dialogue held inside the Rothko Chapel on the campus of the Menil collection. Two chairs had been placed before the audience parallel to one another. The Dalai Lama and de Menil entered the chapel. Facing the public, they paused beside their respective chairs. At that moment, de Menil lifted her chair and turned it slightly in the direction of the Dalai Lama, who remained in position, a sublime gesture of sensitivity and elegance. Some years later, a memorial for de Menil was being organized at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Wilson proposed an installation, two chairs in the style of Louis XV, one placed at a slight angle toward the other. Behind them, a slate chalkboard on which would be inscribed a line from the Book of Revelation. Behold, I set before thee an open door. Thank you. Thank you so much, Owen. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Anyone question? Then I would like to uh, ask about the chairs. Um, what do you think? Uh, Robert Wilson's chairs on stage um, are um, representations of the protagonist, or they do not have any kind of uh, representative functions? Uh, that's a great question. Um, sometimes I think about Bob's work as having a network quality, and the chairs can serve to identify that network. Um, so part of the network is the actor who is physically in the presence of the chair, and part of that network is a historical person whose, pre whose figure or narrative or, or situation is important to the scene. Um, I, I do want to give credit to a fantastic essay by Trevor Fairbrother, which was published, I'm forgetting the year, but um, he has a fantastic short segment about the, the chairs as being um, their relation to the historical figures for which they're sometimes named. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say about that is it's, I think there's a, uh, an interesting difference between encountering the chair on stage in the presence of a scene in which it's not introduced in a formal way um, versus encountering it in a gallery or museum where the title is presented alongside the chair. Um, it's, a, it's a dynamic that I think cleverly um, challenges how we often encounter sculpture. Thank you. You curated a wonderful exhibition in New York, uh, including almost all Wilson's uh, chairs. Uh, what do you think? Uh, does the status of a chair change when uh, you put it into a museum space and when it is not on a stage? Yeah, I think chairs, it's, it's an interesting form to fixate on because in a sense, a chair as a sculpture is just like, you know, a set of tableware, a, a fork and knife as a sculpture, or a lamp as a sculpture, or um, 
it's something that belongs in a domestic space or a professional space or a ceremonial space, a formal space. Um, so I think we have to take, keep in mind that history when you see a, a chair as a sculptural object in a museum context. Um, but what's interesting about Bob's focus on that form is there's this other history and it's a history of a performance and a theatrical moment. Um, and, and as I, as I'm saying, um, a history of a very specific architecture, which doesn't follow the chair to that site. Um, and so in that sense, you could think of seeing, you know, a Judd work that was, I mean, maybe an analogy that's helpful is thinking about a Judd work that was created for, um, a site in Marfa being shown at the Museum of Modern Art and how you would have to have some understanding of that context to see it outside of it. Um, the same could be said for a Frank Lloyd Wright chair that's designed for a specific house seen out of context. Um, Robert Rosen is also a great collector of chairs. Uh, he. Um, he collects them, not just designs them. Um, why are chairs so important to him? Is there any um, legendary story about that? There is. There is. There is Bob's story, which is important, and then there is another story, which I think is important. Bob's story, um, which will also be published in this book. Um, it's a short anecdote that he's, he's published previously, um, actually in Domus magazine, maybe other places, um, about receiving a chair from his uncle who lived in New Mexico as a Christmas present or a birthday present when he was 13 or 14 years old. Um, and it was a kind of simple, austere form. Um, and that was kind of the origin of this idea of chairs. Um, was owning this one and it being a gift. Um, and then later a relative claiming that it belonged to them and it shouldn't belong to him. Um, so that's, it's, and it's a wonderful story that, um, you know, a part of the, the mythology of his upbringing in Waco. Um, I have thought often about the chair as a kind of, one of the most fundamental kinds of architecture that instructs the body. And I think that's, that's my story of why I think it's an important form for him. Um, it's, it's a, it's a kind of essential framework to instruct posture and gesture and attitude. Um, and no other object that I can think of really accomplishes the same thing. Um, I mean, you can even think about, um, there's a book, I think it's called power, how to get it and how to use it. That was a, like a corporate, a business instructional manual in the eighties, um, that Katie Nolan has referenced in some of her work. And there are chapters about how, if you're, if you're receiving someone in an office setting you want your chair to be higher and more prominent and you want their chair to be as close to the door as possible and lower and out of reach from the objects that are on your desk. Um, and there are many examples of things like this, but I think about chair as this kind of, it's, it's an instructional architecture for how the body should appear. Um, and what, yeah, what aspects it has. Thank you. I would like to refer to a possibly deeper personal connection to chairs in case of uh, Robert Wilson. Um, he, in the Absolute Wilson film, he says that his uh, mother sat on a chair as nobody else. So it's a very important memory of the mother and we 
also he commented a lot in this text about his relation to his mother, who wasn't a very sensitive, very loving person. And uh, Wilson, as a child, felt the distance between the mother. And the second thing that is connected to this, you didn't mention it, but at the end of the Oedipus King, uh, the scene is filled with chairs. Many, many chairs come in. And the woman, Angela Winkler is the person, is sitting on one chair and everything, uh, Oedipus self-blinding happens in this situation. And uh, this Winkler person says texts which are very much connected to Jocaste, the mother and the lover of Oedipus in the same time. So it comes back and uh, Oedipus comes in to the scene and starts to ruin the chairs. And as a last moment, he lifts a chair as if to kill the mother who is sitting there on one chair. So I think it has a very, in a, for me, a psychoanalytic interpretation of this situation and the function of the chair for Wilson. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic um, image. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm just thinking about the connection, you know, the early interest in Freud and the couch. Maybe that's another great example of, of a, you know, an architecture instructing the body to be in this prone position on the couch versus the analyst in the chair. Um, and Bob's interest in psych psychology and psychoanalysis. Um, that's, that's fantastic. I would love to take a closer look at um, that part of Oedipus. One last question. Um, that was a really fascinating talk. Um, I wrote about, I presented about When We Dead Awake and in which there are chairs that be the play begins with them moving on their own. They're kind of, um, that express kind of the relationship between the two characters and the woman has con can control them. Uh, and then the second act, um, there's a stone that um, Robert Wilson kind of took an image, a rocky image and created a, a chair out of it. But in both of the both of those, those images are emerge from Ibsen's stage directions. And I found it really fascinating because when I think of Robert Wilson, I think of somebody who's doesn't necessarily, or the, the impression is somebody who's not representing what the stage direction is. And in this play, he specifically takes the stage directions, but kind of makes it his, which is you know the first scene that they're sitting on these wicker chairs, the second scene that um, Rubeck is sitting on a, on a stone, um, and he makes it his own to highlight something about the dynamic between the characters. So um, I was wondering, in your exploration of his chairs, does that emerge in other uh, productions as well, where he's, it's not just, you know, just about the chair as you know, a sculptural piece, but is in the, especially I guess in, in more dramatic works, that it's part of the expression of narrative and character. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to parse for a, an example that speaks directly to that. Um, I mean, one one thing that comes to mind is, you know, in terms of interpreting stage direction um, when it's a literal interpretation, which is a complicated thing for Bob and his work. Um, I worked with him on a production of um, Samuel Beckett's Endgame in Berlin, um, and with the Beckett estate, the stage direction has to be very um, precisely interpreted for it to be a, a Beckett production. Um, and so it was, and Bob hasn't done many adaptations of Beckett as we all know, which is an interesting, um, an interesting dynamic. So staging Endgame, there was this need to kind of check all these boxes in terms of what the scenography indicated. 
um, and one of those obviously is the wheelchair. Um, and so I think that's kind of an interesting mode. Um, I mean, Bob loves structure, and I think that's an interesting mode of interpreting, you know, taking these set elements, um, these pre predetermined pieces, and letting them relate to one another and creating an atmosphere where he's determining the relationship to them, um, but also satisfying, you know, the structural requirements. Um, and I know that's not quite exactly what you were asking, but that's, you know, thinking about Ibsen's stage direction and Beckett's stage direction, I think that's one, just an interesting parallel. Um, but I also think, you know, as with stage direction for actors, there's rarely a sense of agency um, given to any one object. I mean, I think, you know, I haven't thought deeply about this, but it seems to me that with Bob's um, in stage direction, there's rarely a clear agent or actor who has a clear consequence on another person or situation. Um, usually that action is abstracted away from, um, you know, a natural depiction of agency. And I think with the chairs, it's kind of the same. It's there are these, um, you know, there's a, there's a structure for the body. There's a form in relation to an architecture. Um, there's a historical reference or kind of a network reference. Um, but he tends to be restrained when giving something a kind of narrative agency on its own. Um, yeah, that's something to be explored more. Thank you so much, Owen, for your answers and thank you so much for your thrilling talk. Thank you. Well, thank you, Owen, and thank you, Viola. Um, we come now to our next uh, session with Carlos and Stephanie. I would like to ask you guys to come over. So it's about costume and stage, and Owen will stay with us. So we have to speak in the mic because we have our audience. So um, <clears throat> again, welcome everybody here at the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in New York City. It's day three of that uh, Robert Wilson conference with over, I think, 40 uh, um, um, programs. Uh, as far as we know, it's unmatched in the history of theater that there's a conference about one artist, a living artist, over four days. So I think it's something historic, and as we witnessed over the days, really um, understanding is taking place, as the Buddhists say when it comes to knowledge and we get a glimpse into the universe, the kaleidoscope, the Milky Ways and stars and uh, planets uh, of that uh, mysterious force that is uh, Bob Wilson. So um, Carlos and Stephanie, welcome. Thank you for taking the time. We not only wanted to have a hybrid form that we have online and people from around the globe joining us, but also we felt very strongly that we need practitioners, dramaturgs, uh, 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 stage designers, costume designers, um, to be part of it, and this is one of those great moments also in the conference where we listen to artists who also uh, collaborate with Bob, and we feel very strongly at the Siegel Center, even so we are uh, deeply rooted in academia, but we have to listen to artists and what their voices say are important and significant. Ultimately, this is, of course, what theater is about. Maybe you say a few words about yourself, Stephanie? Hi, I'm Stephanie, and I'm a designer for stage and uh, exhibitions and uh, um, installations. And I've worked, actually this year, it's 35 years I have worked with Bob on productions. And um, I'm still working with him on productions. And I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Incredible, 35 years, yeah? It's a big family, as someone said yesterday after some production. It's a, a family that stays together. Um, Carlos. Uh, I'm Carlos, and I'm here to talk about costume, but I also work in um, sort of hybrid forms of architecture, set design, installation, exhibition design, etc. cetera. Um, and you're getting a little mysterious pack of paper uh, because this morning around 3 a.m. I had this like manic 
um, need to write little bullet points, which ended up becoming an essay. And since this is a discussion and a conversation, hopefully I touch on these points, but you have it to take home to like, you know, delve into the chaos that's in here. So thank you for having so me. So this is fresh out of your brain. Yeah. Uh, incredible. Um, Stephanie, when did you meet Bob first and why did you want to work with him? Uh, I met Bob in 1989 at the Schauspielhaus in Frankfurt. And I had been um, a local assistant uh, set designer for a number of years, and I saw the um, knee plays there when he came with this production. Out of the Civil Wars project. Exactly, right? exactly. And I was absolutely fascinated. I had worked with uh, Forsyth, William Forsyth, and I knew this was going to be the direction I wanted to develop my career and my work. And um, so when, after this uh, uh, performance that was seen in Frankfurt, um, the uh, Schauspielhaus asked Bob Wilson to do King Lear. While this performance of uh, knee, the knee plays had been quite a disaster from what I'm told, nobody in the theater wanted to work with Wilson as an assistant. They were all afraid of him. <laughs> so they knew me and they called me back and I said, okay, I would be, I'd love to have this opportunity and I was very excited. And um, this is how it started. Tell us, what did you see on stage for the knee place? Was it the one with David Burns music or? Yes, yes. Tell us, what did you see on stage? Well, it's a moment ago, <laughs> but um, it, it was a choreography of elements that had been part, I think, must have been the Tokyo elements. There were big birds of bamboo and uh, blocks of, um, squ uh, I mean, um, squares that were carried across the stage. It was basically a, a constant movement of elements entering and exiting and in relation to people on stage, with uh, David Byrne actually present, and he was speaking live, if I recall correctly. So uh, it was just mesmerizing and absolutely beautiful. What is your contribution? You know, we talk so much about Wilson's work uh, as an artist, his drawings, the chairs, yeah. and, but you're also a stage designer. How does a collaboration look like with someone who is himself uh, in, in that way, you know? so? thinking so deeply about space, uh, movement, and objects? Uh, usually, w we start with a workshop, a table workshop, where the whole team, our artistic team, comes together, including the designer, uh, the um, costume designer, the uh, dramaturg, sometimes the actors are there, or singers, and um, we look at material that is basically collected before this workshop starts. Um, the way usually my work, of course, starts also before the workshop because knowing uh, it has been become much uh, easier to prepare something for me after several years of really knowing his work very well that um, the images that he will be attracted to, which he will be visioning, visualizing in, in this workshop, he will start making sketches and drawings. And these little drawings that are kind of, basically, it's a way of writing for him. It's like making notes. And I take these little, tiny little sketches, and I will then create proposals of elements of elevations, of uh, renderings, and uh, we start a conversation about this. It basically starts with um, images that are um, inspirations, and then transform and develop uh, just with tiny little maybe elements, or it's maybe a color, or Bob gives me a, a, a part of a newspaper, a New York Times image of an advertisement of, I don't know, something, uh, the p position of a hand. So it's 
not that we speak a lot, we communicate over images and then collaborate over time. And it's a kind of that he doesn't exactly know what he wants to do. And I don't know what he wants to do either, of course. So it is trying to help him to find the right thing. And I must say, this is something that I have not seen with other directors, is that once he finds what, he, what it is, what he would like to explore, he will not change his mind. Because everything is built up into a, a construction of uh, a concept, of a feeling, of uh, some intuitive direction to go, that um, if you change one element, or somebody would change one element, it, the whole thing would collapse. And this is something, for, for me, I would say, it's kind of help trying to help a painter to paint the painting before he knows what it is. It's tough. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder they were scared of working with him. So you built a prop lamp in a, in a workshop out of wood, let's say in a, in a stairway that's also piece of drawers like the Orlando piece, or and then you work with it on stage, you improvise, you put it back, you get it back. How do well, no, generally, let's say it starts with the first mock-up. And when we know that we need a certain piece or an, a certain element, it will be, let's say, built in a, with cardboard or wood or whatever is available, v first visually to say, okay, I have, let's say, for example, for the King Lear, the first production I did with Bob, I built all the elements of the set, which were objects and uh, props. I built full scale out of uh, foam cardboard over nights and nights and nights. And then we would work with these one uh, full scale models to create, to remove something, to shift an element, or to cut something off. And you start working with tape, with a piece that you find in a corner, in a, uh, in a uh, rehearsal studio, or you start taking, okay, I need, a, I need black paint. So somebody rushes, mostly me, rushes <laughs> to get black paint. Uh, and uh, so it, develops and then what is the most important thing is that it has to be used on stage. So let's say if even if visually it, it works, the proportion is right, the, then of course it, the t decisions about materials and colors will be done later. But if I don't know that let's say inside of this staircase of Orlando, there are drawers that have to be opened and there comes this skull that comes out of it. I would not know, I couldn't build the thing. So without the process of rehearsals and finishing the staging, you can never do an object. So it's, I mean, I, a prop. There have been things where um, Really, the, the function is often it's either has a, a light in it or it has to come apart and it just transforms itself or it has to be, uh, um, I don't know, carried in by the actor or actors uh, uh, themselves. So when you start building something out of wood, you said, okay, it can't work because it has to be lighter. So we build things numerous times and it transforms during the process of rehearsal, so that in the end of this phase, we actually have a functioning prop that then I will go and take precise measurements, I will make the drawings, I will pre prepare proposals for materials, and transmit and have all the meetings, technical meetings, I'm taking care of. Incredible, yeah, and we see the objects move on stage with invisible strings, it's, a, it's an incredible work. Carlos, um, when it comes to costumes, what is different? Uh, in some ways, I'm a costume designer is filling in a blind spot. So we're lucky in terms that we're not trying to figure out what he's thinking. We're just trying to f 
fill in a gap where he's not actually thinking about anything because he's the first to acknowledge that he has no concept about costume or body. He has a kind of vague idea in his head that is completely untranslatable. Um, and which will only kind of manifest once he sees the thing. Um, it took years to discover that I don't, and this is maybe a product of our relationship and the trust we have with each other where I don't present him with drawings anymore. Um, one, because I have only a, a, a limited amount of patience <laughs> uh, for dealing with Bob. Um, and so it, presenting him the real object in the beginning of the tech process, which doesn't happen with any director, um, and also having the wonderful gift that Bob gives you as a costume designer, which is the staging ahead of time. Uh, so it's not a hypothetical thing like working in opera, for example, where you design a thing two years out, and then you see it on bodies maybe five days before the premiere. Um, with Bob, it's a much more precise process of, uh, iterative working back and forth on an object. So once the thing is finally on stage, then we start to really collaborate on it and to discuss it. But otherwise there's very little communication, um, which is great, because I hate talking, and so does he. So it's a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> Amazing. Like Frida Parmigiano, you know, one of the great costume designers that comes back to work with him. What fascinates you? What is the inside that momentous effort I'm sure you always put in? Um, I, I don't think that Frida comes back so much. That's why I've been working with Bob, because yes. um, nobody wants to work with Frida. So there's that problem. Uh, I think we all come away with very bad reputations working with Bob um, that we kind of inherit from him. Um, I really do love the man. I'm, I'm, I'm just being facetious. Um, but there's something about... Or maybe I, th I think what I want to say, it's the relationship that Bob has had with a very limited number of costume designers because there are only so many people that kind of understand the way that he thinks visually, which is intuitively. Um, and there's a means where you are, and I think going back to something that Owen said about surrealism and that so much of it is like automatic writing or automatic imaging. It's being a receptor to, and in the same way that Bob works, like the world is his library. Um, if you look at his scrapbooks, it's things cut from newspapers, image, like the, f the flying fish and time rocker came from Bosch. I never knew that until I looked at his scrapbooks. Um, so everything is somewhere in the ether and we, it comes to us in some way. It's very esoteric to talk about it, but in, ultimately in the end, it does boil down to a kind of systematic way of working. Um, which for me has to do with a graphic way of looking at passage of time and looking at a map of performer entrances and exits. Um, ultimately, Bob's work boils down to, it was also funny that Owen mentioned Calm Mountain, Gardenia Terrace, because the subtitle of that work is the story of a family and some people changing, which is ultimately what theater is. Um, and so in some ways it's looking at those transformations in time and watch, thinking how these images transform in time and how that informs a character. Does a silhouette repeat X number of times for each entrance? Does the color change? Is there suddenly a very intense transformation? Um, none of which is rational or logical. It's emotional in many ways. Um, and I think Again, it was something Owen mentioned about agency, like there is no agency in these people. You're kind of like taking empty, uh, empty vessel and filling them with information. Um, yeah, this could go on Talk on. about light and costume. Uh, I think, the th well, working with Bob for so many years, you realize that there's a consistency in the quality of light. You know the palette that he will use. You know that there won't be any amber light. You know that there won't be any yellow light, any warm colors. Um, and that the palettes tend to be kind of repetitive. There's a very, um, there's a very clear cut aesthetic choice, I think, that, that you go into in his work. And sometimes it can be very surprising. Uh, but for me, it's a question 
obviously of, of archetype, of image, of reference, culture, etc. But then it boils down to color, texture, and distance. How does a thing read on stage? How do you decide whether it is uh, immediate and present or distant and um, not present? So you choose material based on how the light reflects or what is best for the movement of a character? We know that uh, Armani famously did costumes for Salome and it didn't work. They you couldn't move and had to be changed. He was upset, but had to accept it. But so how do you select the material, the fabric? Uh, I, I'll point out that the reason Bob doesn't work with fashion design is that they don't understand silhouette, surprisingly. <laughs> they understand image, but in a theater where everything is viewed in, 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 in silhouette backlit, it doesn't make any sense. You know, that beautiful bouquet of flowers that Victor and Rolf designed looks like a fried egg, otherwise, with a face in the middle of it. Uh, I start with silhouette. Uh, and silhouette is informed by material. So there's a kind of dialogue between the silhouette that I'm trying to achieve, which may connote a character, but ultimately it's the material that drives the manufacture of the garment. Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie, um, when it comes um, to stage design, someone used the expression with Bob's work, you, you take away what's not necessary. So how, how do you decide, how do you both decide what is necessary and what not? I think it depends on the production and the method of creating something. Because I don't think it's about starting with a lot and then reducing it. That's I don't I have never experienced that with Bob. It's more about he starts with the essential uh, story line and then starts to slowly fill in his structure, which is architectural and mathematical. So uh, the only thing maybe sometimes happens that um, because he, what he also uh, told us uh, um, last uh, the, the day before yesterday, that he loves to work with opposites, that he likes to have um, contrasts, something slow will follow something very fast, something loud will follow something quiet, something uh, like many things will be followed by just one thing. So you could have like some performances, they start with the curtain opens and you have just people walking in across the stage with objects. And this takes goes on with, uh, um, they will walk around the back and come back and it can take minutes for this procession to come in and something comes out of this procession and becomes a single element or a single person or a single character. So it's the way being minimalist is, in my experience, is really depending on what what do we want to, what's the story we want to tell. How complicated is it as a stage designer to work with the famous Wilson, let's say the horizon, the screen, the you know the neon lights in so many different colors that are behind? How does that? What is possible and what's not possible? You mean uh, technically? Yeah, in, yeah, when you, as a when we file the final product, you know, how does that inform the stage design? What is possible often depends on, in part on budget, <laughs> other parts also in how um, good the team is we're working with, and how, um, I mean, often it's the passion of the technicians, of uh, every collaborator, of uh, um, how much they are able to do. Because uh, in um, Frankfurt, we had a technical director, uh, uh, von Wickel. He always used to say, give me a rope and I can solve all the problems. And it was true. I mean, theater is a place where you can you don't need uh, um, what Broadway does. It's everything is motorized and computerized. It can be just super simple. And 
let's say, if there is a production that has very little money, what we just did, Ubu in Mallorca, where the budget was practically zero, and um, we didn't even have money for a costume designer. <laughs> so Bob started with newspaper, and he made the most amazing costumes out of newspaper for every character of um, this uh, abstract and absurd play of uh, Jari. And um, it was one of the most fascinating moments after s done so many productions where you had, uh, really you have platforms moving, you have uh, electronic uh, 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 built geese that are flying uh, across the stage when you have nothing and you still can do something amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, before we come to, or maybe a question, what happens to the costume? What happens to the props on stage? And how do you feel about it? What happens to them? Are they all be sold? Are they destroyed? In often, uh, Bob, before a production is completely uh, uh, discommissioned, it usually, they ask Robert Wilson, what would he like to keep if he does want to keep something? Because generally speaking, all objects are, in his mind, could also be museum pieces. So they are very, very nicely done and very beautifully uh, uh, artisanship. And um, generally, I would say that uh, m many times also things are thrown away just because there's not enough storage. We just unfortunately lost La Traviata. That was supposed to be done in Remember Bordeaux. The Three Penny Opera in Berlin, the costumes that tragically, you know, was not kept. How, how, what happens to the costumes? Do you keep them? Does he, is there a museum? Or no, everything ends up in a dumpster, um, which is unfortunate. But I, I don't know. I, I spent the last two days shredding old archive things. Like, I don't, I don't keep drawings. I don't keep anything. I don't care. Um, and I think, yeah, no, but, there, but there's something like Paul Tech, you know, like Paul Tech didn't care either. Um, I, I, to me, there's no, the, I, I, I find no importance in it, you know, I, I think I, I'm experiencing it and I'm doing it and, and every subsequent work is a kind of, with other directors in any medium, uh, is a continuous exploration of, of form and, 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 and drawing, you know, it's all about essentializing, like, yeah, there isn't a process of taking away. It already starts as a frame. Um, and I think going back to the question about taking away, I think there was something also going back to Owen's uh, presentation about Bob's fasc fascination with the shaker chair, right? It's an object that has had all matter denuded until it's the least amount of clutter or matter to to assume a function. Um, and there's kind of, I think also what Stephanie and I do in this way in supporting his process is we, we, we have certain tools, I guess, that we can present him. Um, that also reminded me of, um, and I guess the connection between the Shakers and this is kind of maybe just like, you know, monastic contemplative living. Um, but the Benedictine abbot, uh, Hans van der Laan, this uh, Dutch architect who, uh, came up with a, a system called plastic ratios, which were um, systems for designing space that were based on very, very simple ratios and very, very simple color stories that are infinitely uh, reconfigurable for any scale. Yeah, um, yeah they're fantastic. Like, and they're, in a way, Bob Wilson pieces are one endless piece and motifs come back. It's like a soul of it, a minimal, approach, which on the other hand is a, a maximum exposure. Um, uh, uh, Owen, um, you, you had a bit more time to talk before, before we come to audience questions. Uh, it's the end. Um, maybe, uh, for is it really so fast? Um, yes, I guess it is. Um, it just shows we have to do maybe a, another one, but uh, many, many thanks for coming and uh, thank you all for, um, for listening and thank you. Thank you.